Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head. In this episode, we are talking to Wes Barker. He's an accountant and currently holds the position of Director of Strategic Analysis, Economics and Population Health Management at NHS Merseyside. But he's not always been an accountant. He actually started his career as a biomedical scientist. So it's going to be interesting to see how dyslexia works in both fields and whether that drove his career change. I will post anything we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, Wes. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for having me. That's no problem. I just thought we'd start with your sort of first career, so to speak. It's like myself, you've got two careers, which is always cool. How come the biomedical scientist route initially out of, I guess, university for that? Yeah, so um, I uh, I was like many other kind of teenagers that when I was um, wanting to choose my subject in university, I probably just looked at what I was good at. And I liked biology, what was I interested in. And I started to look at um, roles that had a job at the end of it because I didn't want to do a profession or a degree in biology and come out and think, actually, what do I do with this? So um, I I gravitated to health and I started to look at different roles like physiotherapy and and different roles that way. And and I spotted biomedical science as 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 a role working in a lab. And I thought, actually, this could be really really interesting role. Um, I like biology. Um, and my dad, uh, was, uh, he was, uh, he was an academic. He, he was a, he was a professor of organic chemistry. So, um, he worked in the university. Uh, it was just a natural move. They, he said, well, my dad works in a lab. I'll end up working in a lab, following the footsteps. And I kind of, um, I just thought it'd be, I could do the degree. If it doesn't work out, I can do something else. So that's how I kind of picked that subject um, and went to it. I actually quite like enjoyed it over the three years. Oh, okay. So the three years of degree or the three years? You three years in of, of a degree, uh, degree. And then I went straight into then a role uh, as a biomedical scientist. It was hard to get into biomedical sciences because I realized when I qualified, um, when I when I graduated, you need the trainee post. Now, in biomedical scientists, there's loads of jobs. There's not many trainee posts. So they had the conundrum. Oh. <laughs> so they had this issue. Well, how do we get people in? But there's only a few trainee posts a year. So um, I managed to get onto a training program uh, with uh, the Royal Liverpool Hospital in the field of immunology. And I, you have to do that for about a year. And effectively, what you do is you build a logbook because uh, it's a professional qualification um, in that it has to be registered. So having the degree is just the, the theory. You have to really demonstrate the practical skills. And you basically need to show and you get uh, an assessor comes out and he checks that you can do all the stuff in the laboratory and he'll ask you a number of questions. Um, and then you, that allows you to get state registered within um within what's called the Health Professions Council at the time. It's probably a different name now. It's been a while since I left <laughs> uh, biomedical sciences. Oh, okay. It, in my head, it's like loads of people with lab coats and test tubes going everywhere. Or have I watched too many movies? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's it. Yeah, it was, uh, it's uh, lab coats, uh, test tubes, machines, doing different ana- uh, uh, analyzers, um, a lot of ELISA tests, um, uh, electrophoresis, if you're doing, uh, so all the stuff you might hear, it's in the laboratory, that's exactly right. And interestingly enough, we used to do some, we used to go out to schools as well right. to get, and we used to have some some microscopes, et cetera, and we used to show people what we do in the lab just to get people, um, kids interested in science careers. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so as an option, so they see it's, what, this is a day in, day out role. The difference, I think, with a biomedical scientist person in a laboratory, you're dealing with kind of diagnostic samples. So you're there to di- to uh, re- report on diagnostic tests. Yeah. So it's really critical to the patient journey. But probably the unsung heroes, I would say, because they, they're they hidden away in laboratories, so you don't see them. <laughs> so it's quite easy to think of a hospital of just doctors and nurses, and you fail, you forget mm-hmm. these kind of people in laboratories who are doing your tests. So when the doctor says we need to do a blood test, We'll take that away and send it off to the lab. It'll be someone like myself who'll be analysing that and reporting it back to the to the to the consultant or the GP, who would then review the the output of that test and then decide on a course of action for that patient. 
So it's a really part, an integral part of healthcare. Um, but it's 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 you are it's a bit like um, you are a group of people that are stuck in this laboratory. Not many people see you. <laughs> no sunlight. <laughs> no sunlight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, um, quite a lot of dyslexic people are kind of gravitated towards STEM subject, and so you mentioned it. You sort of the other reason you kind of find a job that your father or something in your family does it, and you kind of think, oh, I'll just do what they do. Do you think it would have helped? Did it help you with? being dyslexic and it helps like I know from the engineering background I actually doing a degree that's more STEM and maths based suiting my strengths better and I'm just wondering whether that's the same with the bio- that, science yeah that, that was the reason why I chose it I hated English um, <laughs> so I would yeah. never do anything with English um, history or geography with anything that was heavy with words um, but science was, was uh, the mathematics so you learn logic so you're reading something that once you've learned it um, it, it, that's it. We have to do is put it down on paper, and that was kind of the only problem I had: putting it down on paper. But <laughs> the the the, the, uh, the theory is really exciting to to learn. So for me, kind of cell biology, genetics, um, epidemiology, immunology, all those things really got me ex- excited when I was reading through them. It made sense because I don't know, maybe it was why that way. I just read this stuff, and it just all went in really, really well. I still had the problem of putting pen to paper, but at least verbally I could discuss all the issues um, or all the all the all the concepts quite easily. Um, so absolutely, I think I think a lot of people will gravitate to um, these type of roles. I think kind of engineering uh, and and also there's a the thing about problem solving. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I think dys- dyslexics like to problem solve, uh, mm-hmm. and and for me. You know, you're constantly in science. You're always problem solving. You're always looking for that. There's always a lot of questions you're need answering, and you're trying to research those that come up with research to answer those questions. And I think it just naturally gravitates to that. Yeah, I think that that is great, isn't it? And it's the sort of being a big picture thinker where you're kind of coming up with things from left field to see if it will work. And I, I imagine, do you kind of you're saying you take in the information quite well in the science world? that you kind of can visualize how things go around the body and how the science works. I remember we're doing material science at university and I could, they talk about grain structure and I can sort of move it in my mind as they're explaining what it does when you do various engineering processes to it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was always um, uh, cycles and genetics and mitosis, meiosis and um, <laughs> all of those things that you just it just becomes more complex as you move to university levels. So you learn it in A levels or GCSEs. You just it has to be more complicated. Then it goes further as you go to university, gets, and then it becomes a bigger, bigger cycle and more more of the biochemistry starts to forming because that's what you learn a lot of biochemistry within the degree I was doing. In fact, half the course was with biochemistry. Yeah. So, um, which is another reason why I chose the subject as well, because I had a strong chemistry link to it. And I think that's some of the neurodiversity playing out as well, because um, you're kind of following processes through or are trying to understand, or you can you can think through. So, I mean, I liked immunology because it was complicated. I chose when I <laughs> qualify when I in biomedical scientists, you can become any, any you can specialize in any any specialty. So you can do virology, histopathology, um, immunology hematology uh, and bacteriology so there's quite a few ones you can jump into and decide where you want to specialize in i always knew immunology is what i wanted i was fascinated about the immune system yeah and 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 immunology is gray there's no right or wrong in bacteriology or virology if you either got the disease or you don't have the disease um and then you're trying to work it through but in immunology especially looking at autoimmune diseases it can be yes no maybe Kind of thing, and that can really be annoying for people to 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 try to grasp when they're trying to understand the immune system because it may not be a clear cut as a yes or a no, and therefore, and if you like a yes or no answer, it may that may not be um, a, an area that you would really enjoy. And I used to remember when I used to speak to um, uh, colleagues of mine, friends of mine who were doctors or trained to be doctors, and they they said to me, "Why are you doing immunology?" <laughs> why would you do that they didn't like it they really didn't like the subject well for oh. me i find it fascinating to learn um and even now in covid immunology is a big part of what how the immune system reacts to covid19 why it reacts to it why children react really differently to to, to adults 
um, and all the science around that, you get when you know, I was reading papers when it was coming out, and I thought this is at least useful. I'm, I'm reading up all the stuff I hadn't forgotten anything. <laughs> you know, it's still there. <laughs> so it was really fascinating to see and, and learn. So it, it's a great, you know, for people who are neurodiverse, science is a great opportunity to do that. And the good thing about neuro and science is it's practical. Use your hands. Yes, yes. You are doing tests, so you have to basically do it yourself. There's no, it's not kind of. Um, um, theory, just sitting around reading about it. You have to do the test. You have to report on the test. And one thing I was good at, really good at in immunology, we had um, a test called uh, anti-nuclear antibody tests, which we which we would uh, test of patients who have autoimmune disease. And it was a it was a it was a microscopy test where this, the the cells would come out green, and um, there was different uh, different shapes of green that you'd have to see within the cells. I could see them really easily. I, I could spend, I could do about 90 patients a test, report on them within about half an hour. That was how quick I, it took my colleagues four hours to do. Wow, that's some so, difference. <laughs> yeah, so I could see the green easily. I could see the patterns really easily. Oh, well, gosh, right, they yeah. struggled with seeing the negative. I knew what I was looking at straight away, negative, negative, negative. Yeah, that one I know. It's a positive speckled, negative, positive homogenous, right, next one, post central, next. And while they were like, I don't know, what is that? Is that positive? <laughs> it's negative. Because it was a different shade of green. It, even the negative looks green. So you really have to... Oh, right. Okay. So you really have to be able to see the variations in that green spectrum. And yeah. maybe I'm, at, and they always say dyslexic see in a certain color range and green tends to be one they go with. Because it was in green, I found it really easy to see. It was only years later that I looked back and thought, actually, it was probably because I'm dyslexic that I was able to do that. But that's my, that was one of my strengths in the lab. Uh, I yes, could do that course, really yeah. quickly. And it was a common joke that Wes was able to just walk through and just do something really quick. I really struggled with people who could only do, spend four hours. I'm thinking, why are you spending four hours? It's not that hard. <laughs> but I, yes. was not, I was not appreciating for them. It was complicated. Similar, you know, when people kind of criticize maybe as someone who's dyslexic, it takes longer to read. Yes. Uh, and say, yes. why does it take you longer to read? And it's a similar thing. And why does it take you longer to visually see that? Can you, can you see the green or can you see the problem? Um, so no, um, it... it being practical, hands-on, and in that way is, is really good. Yeah. Did you find um, part of your learning sort of journey through that career, the sort of second part as you shift into accountancy, sometimes is learning that actually I'm just talented at this bit and I have to give people who are not more scope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, abs- yeah. That's something I've I found, as, especially in, in 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 science, but also in in my degree in in, in finance. Um, I found that um, I could see problems in data and analytics better than some of my colleagues did, uh, but they were better at me at other things as well. Um, yes. So they could they could write reports better than I could. Um, <laughs> so it's about kind of how you complement as a team and what your strengths and weaknesses are. Yes, most um, definitely. Uh, so, you know, uh, I think that's the power of a high-performing team is one person could do something really well, the other person could do and you actually complement by kind of sharing and saying, can you help me with this and I'll help you with this. And and then you're producing, so you're collaborating on a project together where one does one and you do the other. And I think that's the that's how then you develop a, uh, an output that's brilliant because each one's, you play to your strengths. Yes. Yeah, most definitely. And it's, yeah, it's having, a, as you say, a high-performance team where, there is no gaps because you've got people who fill the ones that other people don't have, which is quite useful. I'm going to sort of circle before we get on to your career change is really how you discovered you were dyslexic at sort of what age and was it a surprise? <laughs> so, yeah, so it was the final year of my degree. My partner at the time was my wife now. Um, okay. <laughs> she, she she basically pointed out to me that you might I might be dyslexic. Um, okay. I was quite I was quite ashamed of my writing. I used to hide from. Um, I was I used to position myself in the lecture room to be move away from people who would want your notes. So you get you know you, get, you, you know you know you're like in university. You sit down, yeah. someone comes in late and says, "Can I borrow your notes?" And you're, the dreaded shame comes in, thinking, "Not my notes. You can't read my writing." Um, you didn't oh, I make didn't friends with them people. Then I didn't make friends with other people. I so I didn't I didn't take any notes. I just I didn't I didn't have time to. I couldn't write in time, so I just and I used to lie because it was there was a shame about handing over your notes when they couldn't read it. And I had really bad handwriting, really bad handwriting. 
I, I went to the uh, student support services at uh, the university and they kind of said, we'll go go ahead and get you an assessed. And I got a psychological assessor who basically reviewed did a, a test and it took about two hours. And then and then a couple of months later, he kind of uh, met with me and he said, you should give yourself a pat on the back because you, your dyslexia is quite, it's quite severe to get to this level, the academic level you're le- dealing with and having to deal with that with no support is quite, Mm. It's quite is a good good story. So you said you need you don't look at yourself as in any chance of failure, or because a lot of dyslexics who who have got your condition would not have got this far. You must be really determined to to excel. Um, they would have just given up. Um, mm-hmm. So you you know, and I probably was more on the moderate range of dyslexia. Okay. Um, and a lot of I used to lose a lot of marks. I would say in the past, if I look back, a lot of marks. So I knew. I could get probably 70 to 80, 90% in terms of a test. I would probably lose, I'd be on more about 55, 53. I would lose a lot of it where they couldn't read my writing or mm. they the spelling was that poor and they'd mark me down. So it was constant, constant. I mean, I remember one time going into a test, I knew every single answer. If you asked me every time, I'd get 100%. Yes, I scraped yeah. a pass. <sighs> yeah, that's frustrating, isn't it? That is really... So, so you're you're yeah. basically kind of, and then people just thinking, oh, you didn't put enough effort in, and thinking, oh, I know everything. I know, ask me it verbally. I'll ask, I'll answer every single one for you. Yeah. Um, and in school, they just didn't pick up on it. They used to just say, "Whereas if I ask you a question verbally, you'll I'll, you'll give me um, you'll give me the answer. If I asked you to put pen to paper, suddenly you would you'd lose um, you'd lose all the marks. It just disappears. Now, for me, that's a that would have been a kind of uh, a trigger. Red flag, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. A warning sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something's not right here. Yeah. But but for that teacher, they didn't pick up on it. Oh, uh, yeah. So so I I kind of it's a shame because I would have picked up. I got the support, and I probably would have helped in going into university as well from mm. first year all the way to third year. But um, it is what it is. You can only do what you can do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You can only you can only deal with what you know with, can't you? Um, yeah. So. Finding out in third year, would that be the last year of your degree? That's right, yeah. So yeah. did you have any chance to get any of the DSA help or anything? Or were you so far in that by the time it was sorted, you were it at was, graduation? Yeah, it was worthless, to be honest, at that point, to get any help. Um, it did help It did help me kind of realise that um, what I was dealing with. And once you realise that you have a uh, dis- disability, now at the time, I called it a disability because I didn't know anything about it, but at least I knew what I had to do to move forward. And I started to look at kind of interventions for myself and becoming open with it. And when I went to roles uh, uh, in science, I was open about my, my dyslexia. Mm. I just said, I've, I'm, I'm dyslexia, I've got dyslexia. Um, um, they were fine about it. There was not really an issue. I didn't have any issue, to be honest, in science um, at all. So when I went into to the to the biomedical sciences and I was working because it's practical, you know, we do write stuff down, but there was always someone in the team to help out. There was always someone reviewing your work because there's always a do and review it in, in science. You have to have right. that kind of governance arrangement. So it did, uh, it did ensure that someone checks your work, checks your numbers um, uh, and, and that, that, it, it worked. It worked well. Um, uh, it was only when I moved into finance that I realised <laughs> it was a different, different, different ball game. Ah, see, it, this is where I kind of was building to, because it's you sound quite passionate about science. So, uh, how long did you work as a scientist? I was about five years. I was there. So, you did five years of science, and then did a bit of a left turn into accountancy like how, how did that even come about <laughs> yeah so so um uh, i did a masters in human immunity at liverpool university um, right. so i did that part time and i wanted to become a consultant immunologist and i needed to get another trainee post to become a consultant so oh, i was so i was right. state registered and i was i was kind of but to become consultant level you have to do more exams, you have to do a PhD, and you have to then, um, and you have to get a trainee program with us, with a consultant sponsor. So, um, and they are as difficult as they are to get onto becoming a biomedical scientist. So it's the same problem. And I tried for a number, a couple of years, tried to get into a program um, 
to come up in, in the organization I was working in. And we just could not get a program set up. And my manager did help as well. He was trying to find, to get me onto a program to ensure that I get into consultant immunology because there wasn't many consultant immunologists out there nationally. So there was a kind of shortage nationally and probably internationally, to be honest, but it was trying to find kind of the right program. Um, and then I thought to myself, I really don't want to be, um, I, I want to be kind of a, move up to become a consultant. So I'm doing more of the kind of higher ever, high end work where I'm, anal- I'm diagnosing patients. I'm supporting more of the care pathway. I was getting bored with the day-to-day routine that I was doing in the lab. And I just thought to myself, I can't see myself here in the next 20, 30 years working in this role. I just would, it just, I was finding it really boring. It wasn't stimulating anymore. And I just looked at other opportunities and um, uh, I wanted to stay in the NHS. And um, I started looking at finance, opportunities in finance. I thought, well, I'll look at finance. I don't know how finance dropped into my head <laughs> yeah. I, 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 but it did I started looking at opportunities in finance and then I, I I saw that the NHS had the graduate scheme and you could join HR you could you could become a HR professional you can become a general management professional you could become a finance professional um I was between general management and finance but I thought to myself if I take finance at least I get a qualification out of it and if I don't like you know, if I go in, and I can always go into general management later on if I wanted to, yes, rather than yes. go into general management and then realize actually I should have gone into finance. So it was a bit yeah. of logic of why I chose the finance route. It's um, very tactical. Yeah. Very yeah. tactical. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I applied to it and it was a prestigious uh, grad scheme. It was, I think, it was the fourth at the time, fourth or fifth um, grad scheme as, uh, according to the Times paper. Oh, nice. Uh, so it, was, uh, it, was, it wasn't easy to get on, I think, at the time. Uh, over 8,000 people had applied at the same time as me. And there was only about 150 jobs. So there wasn't a lot of jobs for about 8,000 people. Um, so it was a lot of competition. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was successful in getting through um, the scheme. And I got I got a two-year, two-and-a-half-year placement. So you get two-and-a-half years, you train up uh, with SEMA, and then you then apply for a job within the NHS. That's the, that's the, That was the scheme. Oh, I see. So actually... It was more like a work-based training to finance rather than you didn't go to uni full-time or study a accountancy degree or a business management degree. No, you don't need to. To be an accountant, you don't need... All the degree does is give you exemptions to the professional qualification. Yes. yes. So if you if you want to do ACCA or SEMA or ICAW, all, all it does is gives you half the exemptions if you do a degree for three years. You still have to train and you have to work for three years within a finance department and you have to do further exams as well. And you have to do a logbook that gets signed off. So similar to the logbook I did kind of previously when I was a scientist, it's a very similar role. So you could you could become a qualified accountant with ever not ever going into university. What I found was as well, people who did go into university, do a degree in accountancy, tend to fail their ACMA exams or ACCA okay. because the quality of teaching in university was very different from the professional expectations of SEMA or ACAW. So you can get away with passing at a 40% or 50%. They're not like that in SEMA or ACCA. When you pass it, they want you to know it really well and the examiners will just not, will not pass you. So it was interesting when we had colleagues who had done, had done a degree in accountancy, they kept failing. And oh. some of them actually uh, dropped out because they couldn't pass the exams. While us, who were new to finance, who didn't have a clue about anything, we were starting <laughs> from scratch. Yeah. We were passing it because it was all fresh. And, pl- and also, if you've done three years of a degree, you're relying on the last three years of information that you've forgotten to, to help you in an exam, which you now have to learn. While I was doing it fresh, I was doing every, I was doing every exam over the three years. So everything was fresh. Everything was naturally, naturally moving into the next exam. So you actually ended up being a chartered accountant in three years. In theory, if you did the university route, you'd have done three years of degree. And then in six years, you'd be a Six years, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. So just to clarify for people who are not in the finance world, what is SEMA and what is the ACCA? Yeah. So uh, SEMA is a chartered institute for management accounting. Um, uh, so um, in accountancy, there's two professions effectively. You can be a financial accountant, somebody who will effectively look more uh, external in terms of uh, reporting. So they look at the cash. 
They'll look at um, the financial accounts at the year end. They'll do the set of accounts. And they're very much structured in looking at those areas, look at maybe capital projects that you're looking at. A management accountant, their role is about how to how using the data to help with performance decisions, how we can be better at, um, how we can improve our, uh, our financial performance, highlighting risk. They're integrated within the organization. Most directors of finance would have worked in a management accounting role. Yeah. So okay. sometimes class is a sexier part of finance, but I think a lot of financial accounts will kill me for saying that. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's horses for courses. Each one's a bit different. If you, if, you like, if you like the numbers and you're driven in that way, you're probably more suited to the financial accountant. If you're more people focused and you like to work with people and you might work with departments and work with the business, uh, so you're more in the management accountant route and you're, you do the normal month end reporting. So you report on how the position is at the end, month, end of the month. You do the forecasting, you're reporting senior managers. And it doesn't matter what sector you're in, whether it's in retail or healthcare. We do the same thing every month. We'll report on a position to say, this is where the trust is. This is the forecast at the end of the end of the year. And like any, 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 any organization, we need to ensure that we maintain our financial position at the end of the year. Uh, and we report to a regulator, whatever regulator that might be. If it was private sector, you'd be you reported maybe to a shareholders uh, at the end of the year, uh, just to ensure that you're hitting those targets. So, um, and it might be business decisions or business opportunities. So that's what effectively what they do. So, a, a, man- a chartered institute for management accountants, so people who want to work in 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 that role, they want to become management accountants. I always knew I want to be a management accountant. I had no interest in being a, 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 a financial accountant. Now. Um, ACCA or Chartances of uh, Certified uh, Accountants accountants tend to be all-rounders. They tend to do a bit of everything. So they do a bit of tax, a bit of audit, and they can move. They can be financial accountants and management accountants. They can okay. work in practice. So they're more kind of what you call your, your overall rounded every, uh, accountants because they do everything. Um, uh, but but the, 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 the professional bodies have all changed. That was kind of historical now. You, you can do, you, you, you find senior accountants now become working in financial accounts, some of them right. do further okay. exams and do can work in practice. Where previously, uh, ACCA people used to work in practice. So it was it was historical the way they were set up. But it's it's all merged now. It's very difficult to tell you what what the ver- difference is between the two uh, or three. Uh, <laughs> it could be, some of it's prestige. Yeah, <laughs> some people yeah, think one's yeah. better than the other. But I think whatever you do, um, they're all very 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 good qualifications, whichever one you do. Obviously, SEMA is the best, uh, but I'm biased. Of, of, of course, <laughs> you're, you're with SEMA. My, <laughs> uh, my friend's also with SEMA, who, who was on episode one and two of this uh, podcast. So yeah, <laughs> I kind of knew what they were. I was ah, right. So um, you did the vocational route through, which actually sounds quite advantageous to you because you were three years ahead of somebody who did a sort of graduate route. I mean, you already had degrees. So it was quite nice you had that box ticked because... It's quite a nice life achievement, isn't it, having a degree. Did you use any of the kind of dyslexia helping tools with your SEMA stuff as you were training to be an accountant on the grad scheme in the NHS? Uh, No, um, I didn't know how to access it at the time when I came into into finance. And I was that, I was uh, was really trying to learn... um, uh, the theory of finance and the and on all the the systems that they use, and the logic as well um, of how they use, it. and also you have to learn the the, the sector rules as well because SEMA may teach you stuff about manufacturing or retail, but then you then have to think, well, how does that work in healthcare because healthcare yeah, has different yeah. rules, and 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 so you, I was more focused on that that area, trying to understand. Um, I didn't think of actually about myself. How do I best make myself useful with the technology that's there? Mm. I suppose that's something that I should have should have supported myself in. The only thing I did ask for was extra time. But to be honest, I always find extra time useless because um, <laughs> I'm not going to suddenly wake up and find I can spell. Um, <laughs> so you know, it's, yeah. you know, I, I always say it's it's a bit like saying to someone in a wheelchair, "I'll give you a head start off in a race." <laughs> They're not going to run uh, to run. So giving me extra time was just not going to work for me. Uh, it just it just yeah. didn't. It, all it did was give me more time to stress about my spelling and handwriting. Um, 
So that's where I kind of struggled. Uh, that's the only thing I asked for. I did get the extra time, but I realized I kind of finished with everyone near enough. And going back and reading my work um, was hard. I think that's, uh, but, you know, um, I did I did pass the exams. Um, uh, there wasn't an issue. I, learning the, the theory was, wasn't wasn't hard at all. I was actually quite confident in learning it. It was really, I found it really enjoyable as well to learn it. Um, and then um, because you're doing, it's more maths driven, um, it's easier to do because you're doing a lot of mathematics and 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 there is some writing in, but um, I, I, but it wasn't. You know, I found that I didn't find that as an issue as it did in science, which uh, was m- more complex because of the language you have to use as well. Yes, of course. Yes, because you've got all the old long Latin based words <laughs> for everything. <Yeah. laughs> just, just what you needed. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, how do you find being a dyslexic encounter? It's kind of one of the things I thought would be really interesting talking to you with is that I do one end of the STEM subject with being an engineer and then obviously you've done STEM with the science and now you're doing very much the math stuff. Um, and it feels like it'd be an interesting place for a dyslexic person to be if they're not really into the science side of it. And I wonder how it, you kind of find it helps you or, or even hinders you at points. But Yeah, I mean, I think for my first, in my, I didn't have a great placement. I, I, I realised... Other than when I was in fi- when I was in science, it was very open to be dyslexic. There wasn't an issue. I was naive enough to think that that NHS was one big organisation, and actually, um, <laughs> in finance, it'll just be the same. And it wasn't. It wasn't. It was. It was a very. Um, it wasn't a great placement. Even when I said to the program manager that I was dyslexic, her response and, and, and the placement manager response was very negative. Um. And it kind of felt like it was, um, it was a, you know, you, is it, they, they made it, they made it into a, what it was, a disability in their eyes, a disability, because they didn't understand it. So after that placement, I then went into another, and my first role, so I applied to another role because my two and a half years was up and I applied to a role within another NHS organization. And it was with the Liverpool Women's Hospital. And um, I, when I left, that my placement, I was thinking, I'm going to leave the NHS because uh, that was that said to me, actually, I don't want to work in the NHS anymore. I don't want to work in an organisation that treats the, the dyslexic staff in that way. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, too right. <laughs> uh, and I got a role, I, I offered a, a role to go work in, talk, in another, so I was working in the organisation in, in the women's and actually it was a great organisation. Really loved the women's hospital. They were very engaging. They were very supportive. They were brilliant. Uh, uh, it was just it was just chalk and cheese between this placement I had and suddenly being in this organization. And a private sector company did approach me um, and offered me a job. And they said to me, don't go, Wes. They said to me, look, you had a bad placement. You will have a good, we will make sure you have a great time here. And I stayed and I stayed for two and a half years and I had a great time. I, you know, I, I worked with the, with the, I looked after gynecology and surgical services. I had a great time working with the people there. Everyone was fantastic. Everyone was very supportive. It's a very, it's a great organization. I, you know, it was, you know, at the time I was thinking, I wish I'd come here for my training because it would, I would have been, it would have been a different experience altogether. Um, and through that, I learned coping strategies. I didn't ever, I never ever talked about my dyslexia again from, from in the NHS. I kind of hid it. Oh, Although okay. I let my program, my manager, my manager in the women's know I was dyslexic. After I left the women's, I never talked about it because I was worried that I'd go back to an organization that was very similar to my placement. Oh, so my coping okay. strategies were designed to never tell people I was dyslexic. Uh, it was only until I reached Ernst & Young that that changed everything. Ernst and Young have a fantastic culture around uh, neurodiversity and dyslexia and dyspraxia, and they value neurodiversity. They see that they see it as a superpower, as a strength in their organisation to deliver high-performing teams. They see it that you're wired differently, but actually, in in their vision of building a better working world, you can add value to that. And that was just a breath of fresh air to hear that from an organisation, and they believed it. So when I joined them. And I said I was dyslexic. They gave me coaching. They gave me support straight away. I didn't have to ask for it. It was just all thrown at me. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> nice. 
<laughs> and 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 I said to him, well, what, and I said to one of the directors, said, oh, well, what if happens if I struggle with writing a piece of work? And he said, Wes, as long as you do the numbers, I'll get someone else to pick up the words. Don't worry about it. As long as the content's right. It, it was just so different from working. And you think in public sector, that would be where the, the you know, this kind of culture uh, um, will be that you'd expect that in the public sector, not in the private sector, but it wasn't. It was in in the private sector that I, I first witnessed that kind of, um, and the first time felt that my dyslexia was a superpower versus it being kind of this hindrance that it's been around for a long time. And I was embarrassed to tell anyone I was dyslexic. Um, uh, and it was from that point, I would say that my, and if you look on the value of dyslexia, I think they've produced a report recently and they've got a center of excellence for dyslexia now or neurodiversity. No, that is, it's surprising how much difference it makes having the right support. So you would have found out at that point that, you, as you say, it starts becoming a superpower. Does it, did you find out that once you'd um, lost some of the baggage, so to speak, that you were kind of quite far ahead at that point then, as you could suddenly realize, hang on, I have this strength that allows me to do better things and certain things like you were mentioning with being able to read the uh, samples in your science thing I imagine there's stuff with the accountancy you were doing the same thing yeah f- uh, financial modeling uh, which was something I was doing a lot within instant young uh, and they kind of showed me how to do stuff and they really good at working on projects because they would put me in positions and say where's your leading on an economic project to do to find out the economic gap for this health economy and then okay. I had to drop in and I've never done it before and I said to him, I've never done this before. You could do it. And <laughs> I did it. And I did it. And it was amazing. You know, they had more faith in me doing it than I had in me doing it. <laughs> but they, they recognized the potential of you, the individual. And they, they knew you had the skills to deliver it. And they said, you speak to this person, but you can do this. You can do this. Um, and because in, in healthcare or in accountancy or any, any role that you follow, a, a, there's always a precedent. In consultancy or in a, in a role like consultancy, you're going into a project, there's no precedent exists. You've got to rely on your skills that you've developed. and But it also allows you to develop new skills because it, you get used to working in an environment where, and it actually shaped my entire career after that because everything I do now is where no precedent exists. In fact, I, I enjoy that a lot more than when I'm in a role that's very routine. If you know, if you said you come in, I, I, I'm always looking for the added value. Where am I going to change? How am I going to transform this? Or, you know, if I was, if I was the finance director, I would transform the whole finance department. I'd look at the systems, the processes. I'd be thinking in that way. That's yeah, how I would yeah. approach it um, because they taught me in that way. Um, so it was great to work in such a forward-thinking organization that actually pushed me and, and, and stretched me. Um, and and that's really helped me to start to change my move my career in the way it has done. So um I then went off and worked in a number of organizations and then um doing transformational work. So I did a um system transformation in Greater Manchester and then I landed in Mersey Care where I work currently. Uh and uh and I worked uh, originally to do acquisitions. We were acquiring community services. And then I moved into strategy uh, where I sit now um, and I do more of the analytics. And it's in and and that's another thing they taught me. Um, all their accountants could do SQL and 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 all the fancy stuff in AI and they were learning AI. And I came in, I can say, well, I can do a bit of SQL, I could do a V lookup. <laughs> 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 so because everyone's that good, you then have to up your game and you have to learn. Yes. So I was I was learning and I was reading a lot more about AI and I was learning about SQL, what SQL do. And they were saying some of them could do VBA. And 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 it's because of that I had to push myself out uh, that further. And then actually when I came back to the NHS, I'd realized people were saying, Wes is really good. But I wasn't really in my in my eyes. It's just because I was competing with everyone else at that level who were, you know, they were quite bright. They were everyone's everyone was competing with someone else, and they were always trying to learn new things. It was just the environment that created that that that, that helped me kind of push myself into that world. But then that's where I got into the world of machine learning, artificial intelligence, and I wanted to learn more of what that meant uh, rather than the buzzwords that people say. So a lot of people <laughs> talk about. Yes. Or block or blockchain. <laughs> Blockchains, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, do you? Because um, it brings, makes me think of an adage: if you're the uh, strongest guy in the gym, you need to find a new one. Uh, <laughs> but uh, 
Do you think that some of the, it sounds like you're really fast learner and get to grips with stuff really quickly. Do you think that's partly the sort of strength of dyslexia is being able to just absorb information really fast and then turn it out to something you can perform with? Yeah, I think for me, it, it, I can see connections really quickly and I can see how those connections could link into other pieces of work. So I'll bring things together um, where, where others won't see that. Um, I think at one time someone said to me, Wes, you're quite, quite commercial. And I said, I don't think I am. It's just that my dyslexia allows me to see things that you're missing. Um, you know, when they're doing a piece of work or they're doing something, I said, well, if you do that and do this and do this, then you could do that. Oh, yeah. Why nice I think of that? And that's the things that I can do is, is it's not around the maths and, the, you know, people still sometimes think about intelligence, you need to be really good at maths or really good at kind of coming up. It's actually sometimes understanding where you link things in, into the system. Okay. It, could, it, could be, it could be just as simple as just understanding how you, how you see transformation work on the ground, how it can be embedded in the ground versus somebody who can do fantastic mathematics and say, you know, you can have someone who can develop a machine learning algorithm, um, but that algorithm, if it's never, if it's never going to work, no one's going to use it, it's just going to be on the shelf. Or I could take that, I could say, you've developed that, I know how I can embed that in the organization, I can take it through, through and I can, so I, can, I can see the whole system. Mm. So someone will say to me, oh, where's you? that'll never work. You'll never be able to embed that. And I said, no, I can. I'll do this, 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 and it's embedded. Because I will not go from A to B. I'll go to A to Z, A to Z, then back to B. Then back, and I will do it the other way that you will be thinking. Uh, but it'll work. And then we'll go, how did you get that to work? <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just let him get on with it. And we know it works at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you find a lot of that? Because you're now at director level. So... Imagine the nuts and bolts stuff you're getting a little bit further away from, but you're now looking at the big picture, which is normally a dyslexic strength. Are you finding as your career is getting more senior, you're actually playing more to your strengths? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I enjoy uh, system working. I mean, uh, population health is my bag. Uh, I'm absolutely passionate around population health management. And because I, my science is still there, I was, I'm able to read the literature um, mm -hmm. and really understand yes. it and then start, start to to understand how do we make this work and understand the population group. So for me, one thing, I, I, it was actually working with my director of strategy. She said to me, Wes, you need to do something. On, we need to do something on population health management. And I said, that that sounds like somebody else, not me, because Can I'm you finance. clarifying what's population health management? Yeah, history? population health management um, is about looking at the whole person so, so when we in currently in healthcare, we'll focus on conditions like respiratory, mental health, obesity. We'll forget that the we might be dealing with the same person who has respiratory, who has obesity, who has mental health issues, and then we'll fail to understand that person has his family unit. Where do they live? Because they, although someone who let's say someone has drug and alcohol problems and has uh, mental health conditions as well, they might be married to somebody. And their children might be impacted because they're seeing their father in this chaotic lifestyle or complex lifestyle. And therefore, I need to find that need. I need to understand that need and how I can reach out and support that person because I will only see them when they're in crisis. Yes. Or when they need help. Yeah. yeah. So how do I find people who really need help in, in, society, in, in, in the population um, and be proactive rather than reactive. So once you turn up to a &E, it's a bit too late because you're there in A&E at the moment. But what can I do to put you in community care, keep you in community care? What can I do to, leave it to ensure that you can be supported in the community? Um, so population health management looks at the whole population. We kind of, you're segmenting the population to understand them, their needs better. And then you're putting interventions in place that support them. And it could be helping people more in crisis situation, uh, um, uh, and, and ensuring that their, their needs are met. And it also could mean that looking further ahead, upstream, where we could have young people and uh, trying to help them now to avoid them moving into areas of drugs, violence. Um, it sometimes gets confused with public health initiatives, it's, but it's very different. And it's about a system response. So it's not just health. So we work with voluntary sector organizations, housing associations need support, who can support us on this work. Uh, could be anyone who wants to work on population health management, wanting to do some work on with, with an organization like Mercy Care. And we work with a range of partners. Uh, and it's not always we have the solution because voluntary sector are working with people on a day in, day out. Uh, local authorities are working with, with individuals um, with, through the social care lens. So that's 
effectively population. It's very system. It's very people. It's very dynamic. Um, uh, and 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 I and for me, that's where I I'm interested. I'm interested in how do I improve the population um, of Liverpool, Sefton, Nosley, Holton, uh, Warrington is the areas that we cover. How and also in Cheshire Merseyside, how can we improve those population groups? Uh, if by doing interventions now, that improves outcomes in the future. You know, if 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 you if you're at the moment, if you need mental health support, if you're if you if you have, if you're somebody who has complex care, you might have you may be one day with an acute hospital consultant, the next day with mental health consultant, the next day with a district nurse, the next day with a GP, and you're you're bouncing around in all these services. How do I ensure I can I can ensure that actually the services come to you, and your your care is coordinated in that way rather than you going everywhere. See- that doesn't sound like a finance role. So. <laughs> no, it's, it has strong economics um, component. A lot of yeah. what I do is in strategic analytics. Right. Okay. So, so it's another kind of different way. So that's why my role in strategic analytics is a different move away from finance, pure finance, I'd say. It still has very much looking at data and, 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 and management accountants will look at data and analytics to drive their, understand their finances. Because you have to know what your performance is to explain the numbers. Um, it's the same thing. I'm looking at the data, trying to understand what does that mean. What is the, you know, what does that mean in terms of the analytics? What is that telling us uh, in terms of the needs of the population? And then, if we are putting a business case in, what's the health economics component of that? So the finance element is still there. The the analytics component is a lot stronger in this one. So it's a very, it's not, you can call it a new role. <laughs> It's a third role, but I see it as a combination of my two other roles together, kind of a hybrid, because I'm using a bit of science, because I'm doing the research, understanding the people's needs, I'm um, looking at the analytics and data, which is probably something I did a lot in in, in science, because you're looking at a lot of numbers and data and analyzing intelligence to inform um, an, an outpatient, a, a diagnostic result for a patient. Um, so it's very similar. It's just using it in a different way. Uh, and using my finance to help for the economics, health economics side. It's one of the nice things about having effectively two careers, isn't it? You end up having a unique skill set, don't you, where you've got the finance arm on one arm, but you've got the scientist to back that up. So you've now found a role that sort of bolts the two together, which there ain't many people who could do that because there's not many people who've got a finance background and a scientist background to be able to do this kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the one of the benefits of being a director have been that I've um, created that I set up the dyslexic and dyspraxic network at Mersey Care. Mersey Care have got the just and learning culture, which is centered around psychological safety. And it's it's that it's that psychological safety that I built my network my network on because it's the foundation that you need. And um I was able to come out for come out come forward and say I was dyslexic. A lot of people sometimes say to me, I didn't realize you were dyslexic, Wes, which, which, is some, which is a good thing and a bad thing because people think dyslexia is negative. What I want them to think is, wow, you're dyslexic. So I, I talk, I, a lot of the work I do in Mersey Care for Dyslexic and Spraxic Network is to address some of the, the issues that we have and the problems we have, but more importantly, to really highlight dyslexia as a strength. Um, I don't know if you've seen GCHQ and the dyslexic spies that they have um, they do a lot no. of work in dyslexic spies. No, um, no. <laughs> um, well, it's it's great if you if if you Google them or YouTube them. GCHQ dyslexic spies. There's there's videos on them. You can't see the faces obviously because for oh, security reasons. Yeah, but yeah. There, a lot of them are analysts uh, who are looking at data and analytics. So I think people who are dyslexic can move into this space. Uh, really, really, it's a great opportunity to move into our finance or analytical background, whether it's science or or or. or Business intelligence, data science—it's an area for, for people to move into. Yes, yes, it certainly sounds like during the conversation with you that you we're picking up on various strong points that your dyslexia brings to the role of finance and science, and now as director as you are, it kind of brings me round. You almost come a little bit full circle with the fact that you now have a son that's got dyslexia, or you found out in the last few years. How are you helping them on their journey? sort of in your home and how it's changed since you started your career and found out at university to him finding out now? So it was uh, it was interesting because for his, I knew he was dyslexic. 
Um, yeah, I kind of yes. went to his primary school teacher and I said, he's dyslexic. And I said to the Senko at the time, and the Senko said to me, he's not dyslexic. He doesn't, he doesn't write backwards. And I thought to myself, <laughs> I don't write backwards. No, no, no me neither. <laughs> so where's this come from? And yeah. she would not have it. He was dyslexic. She would not have it. I, I, and I had to pay privately to get him assessed. Um, and because he was, he was, he was, had mild dyslexia, people with mild dyslexia get ignored because the school system will not deal with them unless they're struggling. So unless you're severe or moderate um, dyslexic, they will just ignore those individuals or those children, which is wrong because those children can, are not really reaching their full potential. Um, and they're struggling. They're struggling and, and you're leaving them to struggle. Um, so I actually paid for his, for his psychological assessment and uh, the assessor said to me, she, he, he has visual dyslexia, which I didn't know anything about at the time. Um, and she said, it's not like your dyslexia wears, his dyslexia is very different from you. So when I kind of explained to him his dyslexia, I basically said to him, you know, congratulations, you're part of an amazing group of people, you know, high five, you know. Uh, and we, we, we at, around that same time, made by dyslexia, we're doing an event at the time. Um, and uh, we basically together sat there and we were listening to all these people and the comments were amazing. People are saying, this is an amazing group of people. And we watched, we listened together. And I said to him, look, um, you know, it hasn't stopped me. I've become, you know, look, I've become, I was a scientist. I'm an accountant. I did everything. I, you know, it hasn't stopped me. In fact, it's given me so much more. All we need to do is ensure that we put in place the support that you need um, and you can do anything. You know, I say, I say to my staff members as well, that when I come and tell me they're dyslexic, I say to them, I said to, um, I said to, for example, a healthcare assistant who came, said to me, I'm dyslexic, I want to do nurse. I said, you can do anything. You can be the prime minister tomorrow. There's, there's not, nothing stopping you. So don't think for a second your disability hinders you to do any of those roles. You can do anything you want. Um, it's, and we make to ensure that we put in place the support mechanisms to allow you to to um, to support you in your role better, and that's the key here. And it, you, you know, I think the permanent secretary is, is dyslexic. Uh, Ruth May is dyslexic. Um, a lot of dyslexics are out there, and a lot of famous people are dyslexic. Yes. And, yeah. And I said to myself at the end uh, of the conversation, I said to him, you know what, I, you know, with these people, you know, Steven Spielberg's of the world, would they still been successful if it wasn't their dyslexia? You know, if you took that away from them, would they've still been as as great and creative as they as they are now, or would they've just been someone else? And and that and that magic goes. So, for me, dyslexia, I view it as a double edged sword. It takes something away from you, but it gives you as well. And yes, it's, it's how you start to visualize that 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 what it gives you. So I always say to people, "What's your superpower?" And <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm going to ask you, Matthew, for your next call with your next person you speak to is dyslexic ask them what their superpower is because i think every one of us has a superpower um and it's getting people to think of that as a superpower what is it what is your superpower that you dyslexic gives you um for me it's analytics it allows me to see data in a very different way it allows me to problem solve um uh, it allows me to see connections where people can't see uh, um, so that's my that's my superpower. That's what it gives me my X power, X men, <laughs> and men and women. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so that's 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 how I how I view it. Uh, and for my son, um, he was it was really interesting. Uh, he was doing something on an app one time, and it was a picture app that he couldn't he couldn't use, and he was able. Uh, he was we had to he had to pay to use it. And he, had yes. to, he was able to circumvent all the controls because so if you do this, do this, you don't have to pay for it now. Not and I said, wow, how did you do that? I said, well, <laughs> if you screen record it, then you can put it back in the app. Then you just you, and he literally broke the whole program. <laughs> and I thought that's your superpower. You just yeah. figured out how to problem to. solve something. You just hacked yeah. the whole the app. <laughs> ah, brilliant! Uh, yeah. I thought that was amazing. I just saw, and he, and no one taught him. He just said, you know, because uh, I said to him, "How did you do that video?" Because the app only allows you to do 10, 10 seconds of it. Because then it locks. Oh, I did this, 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 and this, and it was just amazing. So I said, "That's your superpower. Yeah, you can yeah. see things, problems without, and you just did it. You didn't even think. You just did it." And I said, that's the problem. You didn't see it as a superpower. You just thought everyone else can do it. And I can't do what you just did. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. 
you don't realize sometimes until somebody and you're like, well, why didn't this person just do this? And they're like, because they do not have the ridiculous ability that you have to do that particular task. Oh, oh, okay. I just thought that was normal. <laughs> <laughs> right. This kind of brings me around nicely. I have a few sort of quick questions I ask at the end of the podcast. Um, you don't have to give me quick answers, but let's uh, give these a go. So my first one is what prejudice have you had about dyslexia that has been proven wrong? So uh, prejudice that for me would be that it's only, it's a disability. Um, it's not a disability. I don't view it as a disability. Um, um, to me, it's, it, it's a gift. I, I don't want, if you came to me tomorrow, Matthew, and said, I've got, a, I've got a cure for your dyslexia, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't be able to do my job. If you did, <laughs> I'd have to learn a new role, but I can't. But, yeah, yeah. but, but that is it, it. That is for me. Is 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 it's it's. And I appreciate. I appreciate that for so for really severe dyslexics, it can, it can be a real disability for them. So I'm not taking that away from them. No. But no. but 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 I'm talking about kind of kind of the, the more more uh, majority of people with dyslexia versus the kind of severe end. Because um, I, I can appreciate if you have really severe dyslexia, um, it can be it can be it can be really difficult to manage on day to day. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it can, and it's um, it's great the positive light, but it's also remembering that some people that it's a spectrum thing, and if you're on the far end, maybe hearing it's a superpower is all, almost slightly demoralising. But that's yeah. not really what we all mean. We like actually we just wired differently and bring something else to the table that is great for organizations and everywhere else okay the second question is how do you describe this lecture if an alien come down and asked you what it was that's a really good question <laughs> <laughs> i probably wouldn't describe it at all i think i think i wow well, i wouldn't need to describe to an alien anything um I think it's 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 the way around. It's human beings that have a struggle with it. Aliens wouldn't wouldn't be interested <laughs> about my disability. They wouldn't see it that way. I wouldn't have to explain to somebody external to say to them, you know what, I have dyslexia. Um, I, I just couldn't, you know. Um, I mean, if I had to pull something together, I'd probably say it's a double-edged sword. I, you know, I I can't spell, I can't do grammar, but. I can do all this fancy, great stuff. I can see things <laughs> and linkages better than than other people. So, uh, and 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 assuming an alien has the ability to travel light speeds, he probably wouldn't care about the <laughs> about the word and stuff. He'd be thinking, "That's not a problem. I don't need you to do that. I want you to do all this stuff that you know I'm interested in." Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Grammar, grammar is less important if you're traveling at light speed, right? Yeah, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Right, very last question in the podcast, as always, being that this is the Dyslexia Life Hacks show, do you have any Dyslexia Life Hacks? Um, I think my, I think for me, it's always been, IT has always been my, um, really easy for me to, to navigate anything I do. So I've never had a problem with, um, I've always found when it comes to an IT solution or system, I could just work it really, really easily. And I don't know if it's part of my dyslexia or, my, or a hack, you want to call it, but I've never struggled. When people struggle with 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 a, with a system and say it doesn't work or Outlook doesn't work or Excel doesn't work or our PowerPoint doesn't work, I always found it to work. So they'd send it to me and say, where can you sort it? And I was just able to do it. I'll Google it online. It says, do this, do this, do this, and it's done. And I'll be able to do it. And then it's, you know, and I'll send email it back. Whether that's a life hack, because I can just follow a process. <laughs> <laughs> I think building stuff into IT and being able to just get it to work is quite useful. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, that's cool. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the podcast. Before we sign off, is there any anything you'd like the audience to reach out to you or if they want to get hold of you or, or any kind of things like that? Yeah, I, I, I'm on LinkedIn. So if anyone reaches out and sends a request in and more than happy I always accept it so don't worry about that and if you want to chat to me about the dyslexia or even the work I'm doing in Mersey Care um, I'm more than happy to share some of the insights we've 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 done um, and some of the learning we've done we've still got a long way 
to go, but it is, um, it's great. I'm just mm. trying to think of a life hack now. I can't think of a life hack. <laughs> <laughs> I, should have, I should have thought of something, actually. I'll, I'll go away now and I'll think of something, I think, uh, actually. Yeah. If, you, if you think of something, uh, fire across to me and I'll tag it in the show notes and maybe uh, turn it into its own separate hack. We're, we're <laughs> <see>. <laughs> just trying to think, what, what, what life hack to what, what I forgot? I don't think I've got anything. It's mainly Excel. Which is boring. <laughs> Such an accountant. <laughs> <laughs> well, while you go away and think about that, we're signing this podcast off. And I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come on and listen today. And to thank everybody else for listening. I will catch you in the next episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, I'd really appreciate it if you would share it and subscribe on your podcast platform and hopefully give us a review. It really helps to get in front of more people. Bye for now and see you in the next episode.